Hello, welcome. My name is Manfred Klein. I'm with Innovative Mag Drive or InnoMag. We make the sealless mag drive pumps that are Teflon lined. We make them in uh, Chicago, Illinois, and we sell them all over the world. In the mining industry, they go into the acids, caustics. Uh, they also get into the liquors and things at the refineries. We also have a dedicated team of engineers. We use very advanced uh, fluid dynamics to design our impellers because our target is to make a product that is as efficient as possible. Our actual market these days is replacing mechanically sealed pumps. So if you have a mechanically sealed pump that's less than about 120 degrees Celsius, and you have a double mechanical seal on it, odds are my pump is much more cost effective and you won't need the seal pot life system. Our largest product line is what we call the TB mag. TB mag stands for thrust balance mag drive. Uh, we have a full range of ANSI sizes from the one and a half one by six through the uh, six by four ten size. We go up to, at 50 hertz world, to about 60 kilowatts. What's different on a mag drive? You have the, uh, the magnet at the back that's driven by the uh, electric motor. It transmits its magnetic field into the impeller. We have a uh, graphic here, or a video, that's showing the main flow path, the red flow going through the suction and out the discharge. That's the flow that you want to happen. We also have secondary flows that go around behind the uh, impeller through the magnets and the bearings, and then around, it leaks around through the suction. Whatever it is that we're pumping, whether it's sodium hypochlorite bleach, or whether it's uh, uh, sulfuric acid or caustic, whatever, that is the oil that is lubricating my, my uh, bearings and my impeller thrust balancing. So here we're going to show you what we mean by thrust balancing. When you eliminate the mechanical bearings that are in a regular sealed pump, we have to then figure out how are we going to hold the impeller in the right place while it's spinning. So we said, well, the radial bearings are rotate around a stationary shaft, but the biggest forces are the axial forces. The yellow is low pressure of the liquid coming into the pump. The red is the high pressure of the liquid that the impeller has imparted to the liquid, but the green is an intermediate pressure, and we actually control that intermediate pressure. We have a, uh, a set of silicon carbide rings, and I'll take this pump apart and pass it around so you guys can see what they really look like, that when the red liquid squeezes through those rings, it drops in pressure to about a quarter of the uh, discharge pressure. If the impeller moves forward, the green pressure is allowed to go lower, which changes the overall force balance on the pump, which pulls the impeller back. If the impeller goes back, the green pressure goes higher and it pushes the impeller forward. So it's a built-in control mechanism that allows the impeller to just float. We do that on all the pumps, whether it's our smallest pump or our largest pump, the impeller floats inside there. Big advantages for that are it allows us to pump very light liquids. We have customers that uh, are producing freons that you would have in your air conditioning systems, which are very difficult to pump. They're heavy liquids, but they flash into vapors very easily. Being floating and not adding any heat, it works fine. It also allows us to handle uh, into the higher horsepowers. So our pumps are made with a Teflon. Teflons are great materials from a chemical point of view. We can handle any pH range from the caustics through to the sulfurics, the hydrochlorics, whatever. You can have the same pump in a huge number of applications in a plant without having to worry about metallurgies and erosion and corrosion rates and stuff. But you have to then figure out how are you going to control the forces on the Teflon because the Teflon is much softer and weaker than a stainless steel. So this thrust balancing lets us do that. When we have high horsepower pumps, like the 60 kilowatts or 100 horsepower in my world, the floating actually saves about 50% the energy compared to other people's pumps. So we made it float or thrust balance so that we could handle a wide variety of fluids. But it also gave us the advantage that having the hard wear rings at the front and back of the impeller 
it constrained the solids that are always in real world applications to being in the impeller in the casing area. None of them go back into the uh, containment shell or bearing area where you could potentially lock up the impeller or whatever. That is what we're demonstrating with the uh, funny aquarium running around outside there. We're just demonstrating that the impeller handles the solids and none of it goes back into the bearing and area. The clearance between those rings and because they're silicon carbide, the clearance doesn't change over the life of the pump. It's very small, 0.13 millimeters. If you work with fluoropolymers or have line pipe on your acid systems, you know that eventually some of the small ions and stuff will leak through the fluoropolymers. The plastics themselves are not attacked by the liquids that you're pumping, but they do allow like individual chlorine ions or fluorine ions or things like that, the very small molecules or individual elements to leak through. The magnets we use are rare earth magnets that are highly refined and they tend to rust even if you had them sitting in your desk in an air conditioned office. They would tend to rust because they easily get attacked by um, anything in the atmosphere, water or whatever. So in our case we said, well, let's make sure that doesn't happen. We want a pump that will last 10 years in the nastiest service without any issues. So we did three things. We have plated magnets, so they have a nickel plating on them to keep the first barrier. Then we do a stainless steel cover that's hermetically sealed and welded. And then we cover the whole thing with plastic, uh, the fluoropolymer that's hermetically sealed again. So we provide three layers of, of protection for the magnets, which is the most critical part on a mag drive pump. And in our case, in concentrated sodium hypochlorite, which has a lot of uh, tendency for the free chlorines, will last 10 years. If you strip the plastic off, you might see that the tarnish would be on the stainless steel but our competitors would only last about six months in the same application. The impeller is made from black ETFE uh, fluoropolymer. The casing has white ETFE fluoropolymer. The only difference between those two materials is we add carbon fiber to the black plastic because it needs to be rigid by itself. We didn't want to put any metal reinforcements under there because we want to be able to have the customer be able to trim the impeller size to whatever he needs. So it's easily put on a lathe, trimmed down to whatever diameter you need to match your application. <clears throat> on the casing, it's slightly different. We take the same resins and we melt it into the casting. So the normal casting material is uh, ductile iron and uh, through a giant barbecue process, we actually melt the uh, plastic inside and after it's finished melting, then we machine it to the shape we need. All of the TB Mag pumps have the same number of parts. They have a casing, an impeller that you passed around, inside the impeller are the bearings, there's a containment shell that closes up the back end of the pump, there's a single static O-ring that closes the back of the pump and seals it off. There is no there are no dynamic O-rings or seals other than one single excuse me, um, static O-ring. That's what we call our wet end. It doesn't matter whether it's our smallest pump, which you're passing around right here, or our largest pump, which is our 6x410, which is about that high. They're the same number of parts inside. They just get scaled larger and larger. The casing is, as uh, I explained, we take a ductile iron casing. We melt the plastic inside. That's how it gets its extra strength. It protects the ductile iron from the process. We also, compared to, I don't know if anybody, have, any of you have used other people's mag drives, we have a completely open suction. We did that consciously because we wanted to be able to have the same NPSH values as other people's sealed pumps because our market is to try and replace mechanically sealed pumps, not just replace all the other mag drives that are older technology. Some people, they take the, uh, mold the impeller and the impeller might be molded out of three pieces. They'll have a front shroud, which is the front part of the impeller, that's one piece. They'll weld it together to the next piece and then they'll have a magnet assembly that snaps on. Fluoropolymers creep over time, so you have to be careful. If you keep your stresses low enough, you're gonna be okay and you won't have any problem. But if you have fits that snap together and stuff, over time those get loose and wear out on you. That's why we consciously said, well, let's make sure that the impeller can be, have as low, low a stress as possible. 
That means we have to mold it at one, as one piece at one time. More complicated in terms of how to form the blades and stuff. Also, that way we can go up to the full 60 kilowatts or 100 horsepower. And to keep down inventory, we consciously decided that the magnets on the impeller will always be the maximum magnets that are ever needed for that pump. So you never have to worry about, do I have the right impeller? If it's the impeller that fits in the casing, it's the right impeller. We do very uh, nice blade geometries. We want to have good NPSH, high efficiencies. Um, we don't want to have any extra welding. All of the wear parts in our pumps are silicon carbide, alpha centered silicon carbide. It's about as hard as you can get. It has the same corrosion resistance as the uh, Teflon liners. So you don't have to think about whether or not, if it's okay with the Teflon, is it okay with the silicon carbide? The impeller spins around a stationary shaft, which is held in the containment shell, which I'll pass around in a minute. And then there's just one single static O-ring. Most people prefer to buy our uh, FEP Teflon with the Viton core, because then they can take our distributors can say, oh, this pump can go into caustic, it can go into hydrochloric acid, I can put it in sulfuric acid. I don't have to think about whether or not it's going to be the right O-ring. We also offer it in other materials for customers who uh, want that feature. The next big thing, if you're going to go to all the trouble to make a hermetically sealed pump to make sure that whatever it is you're pumping doesn't get into the environment, you really want to make sure that that pump is strong enough to handle real world situations. So in the real world, if you have our pump hooked up to metal piping and somebody closes a valve way downstream or there was an air pocket and the pump gets turned on, you can have water hammer, just like you're going to have water hammer in your house when you turn on your taps. Water hammer pulse, if it's really severe, can be about 100 bar, so about half of that burst pressure there. If you didn't build your pump strong enough, you would blow out your containment shell and you would have a massive leak right away. We said, well, let's make sure that we're twice as strong as we ever need to be so that you won't ever have a massive leak. And we've never had a water hammer leak, even though we know that probably half the applications have a water hammer at least once or twice in their lifetime. Some of them have it every day if they're a batch job. So we said, well, we should try to design this really strong. So even though it's not, very, it's not a very thick part, we have a burst pressure of over 200 bar on the containment shell. The final part on the wet end is not very exciting. It's just a ring that bolts it all together. It keeps pressure on the O-ring and keeps the containment shell from popping out. So that's the liquid end of the pump. That's the critical end is how you design the uh, part where the liquid contains. The rest of it is just straight sort of mechanics. So we have uh, housing that has the magnets on the inside. That goes onto the motor shaft. The motor spins that. It has magnets on the inside. Those mag the magnetic field transmits through the containment shell, the yellow piece, and it locks onto the magnets on the back of the impeller, and that's how the impeller gets spun. There is one setting in this whole pump. When you put it together, you slide the outer magnet into the adapter. There's a groove on the front of the adapter. And when that groove lines up with the front of the adapter, lock it down, you're done. That's all there is to it. There is no, you don't need to do it a field alignment. You don't have to have a laser alignment system, nothing. 99% of the pumps we sell are what we call close couples. So you have a C face or a D flange motor C-face in North America, typically D-flange in the IEC world. Bolt it up. When it's tight, it's done. No gaps. That positions the motor. On the other end, you put the magnets. It allows us to make a very compact arrangement. So it comes in handy in the corrosive world. A lot of times the base plates and stuff in the where we're replacing the mechanical seal pump have eroded away. You don't have to go and fix it. The pump doesn't care. The pump is self-aligning. Everything bolts together and it's self-aligning. We also make <coughs> some vertically, uh, vertical inline versions. Basically, everything is exactly the same. The impeller still floats. The weight of the impeller 
is nothing compared to the hydraulic forces on the impeller, so it's still thrust balanced even though we now take the pump and mount it vertically. Basically, it's just a different casing. We put the lining in that casing. A lot of people in the oil and gas industry, in, uh, on um, drilling rigs and things like that, where space is a premium, on barges delivering chemicals, they want the format like this. <clears throat> We have a couple other specialties. We make a, uh, so we make the strongest wet ends in, uh, in the market. We don't want any leaks, but sometimes you're pumping something that's very lethal, whether it's like a titanium tetrachloride or uh, phosgene or whatever. So typically that would be a can motor application. But we said, well, can motors don't handle upset conditions very well. They really don't like it. They have a heavy rotor, they have a hot, they have uh, heat inside them. So we said, well, let's do it the other way around. We'll add a mechanical seal to our pump as the secondary backup system. <clears throat> so it's the standard wet end. We add some O-rings to it. We add a mechanical seal. So that provides the emergency containment if there's ever a problem. In normal operation, the liquid would stay in the green area, the wet end, like we passed around. But if there was ever a breach through the containment shell, it's then held in the adapter and the mechanical seal and you would put a sensor on it. The number one way to make sure that your pump has liquid in it is a power monitor. The, this unit goes into the bucket or the motor control center or near the starter and it measures the voltage, the, the uh, current and the power factor. So it's measuring the true power going to the motor. If the motor, when it's normally operating, say it's taking five kilowatts to operate, set one the lower limit at maybe three and the upper limit at like six or something, and if it ever wanders beyond those ranges, it turns it off. A lot of times uh, at truck unloading situations, they will install this, the truck driver comes up, he hooks up the hoses, he opens the valves, he turns it on, then he can go have a cigarette and a coffee and this thing turns it off for him. We have heat jackets for customers that have uh, thermally sensitive liquids. Also a difficult thing if you're in the corrosive business is how do you measure temperature and get some uh, values of what's going on inside the uh, pipe. So we made a silicon carbide thermal well with a, either an RTD or a therm thermocouple that bolts into the drain of our uh, drain flange of our casing. So it provides a very inexpensive way for customers to get some idea of what's going on in the liquid. Silicon carbide's nice because it has a good thermal conductivity and gives you good uh, uh, response time. You can see this guy outside. It's just different ways of driving the magnet. Doesn't matter to us as long as it spins and it's held in the right place. Thank you very much.